Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtojawcomics.net and welcome to today's video. In this demonstration, we're going to be continuing on with the Arachno Morphet concept and this time we are zooming into the head to really knock out some of the finer details that that will entail. And whether it is designing characters or creatures, I really like to get in close and articulate on a finer degree of intricacy exactly how the head of the character specifically will look because it's the head of any character that the audience is going to hone in on first and focus their attention. Why does the audience do this? Well, it's because the face of a character is full of these complex muscles that allow us to express how we're feeling, what we're thinking, whether or not we're angry, whether or not we're happy. And so we're able to gather a lot of information here as to whether this character is going to attack us, whether they're going to be friendly. And it's important that we're able to incorporate those attributes into the concept of our creatures or characters alike, because what it allows us to do in turn is make them feel more real. And when you can make your character feel more real, then they become more believable and they hold the attention of the audience for much longer. We tend to like things that feel believable. If it doesn't make sense or it just it it doesn't feel like it could exist in reality, then we kind of become disconnected. We switch off. We're not really all that interested in things that don't engage us on that more believable level. And so for me, the head design is really where we get to establish that believability. It's the strongest, most powerful form of emotional connection that you can establish between the audience and your character design. So other than that, it's just a whole lot of fun. You know, you're dealing with a lot of different little itty bitty details when it comes to the head design of a character. You get to really get in close and sculpt out the facial features, where they're going to sit, how they're going to look, and especially when it comes to creature design, that is super, super fun to be able to do. And uh, I really just love to lose myself in the process of creature creation, especially at this point, because you really do get to knock out some of the details here. And when it comes to sketching out the initial draft of the design, like you can see I've done right here in front of you, I just, I loosen up. I really don't get too caught up or too worried. I don't stress out too much about whether or not everything is sitting where it should be sitting because to me, it's all changeable. It's all interchangeable. Nothing is set in stone until the illustration is called complete because, you know, we're working digitally here especially, but even if I was working with a traditional pencil and paper, there's the eraser tool which you can just, you know, use to redo areas that you're not quite happy with. Uh, digitally, you can move things around, re position them as needed in order to arrive at the most desirable outcome for your concept that you can possibly achieve. And so, you know, not, again, everything is totally changeable. There's no necessarily worries about making mistakes along the way because it, there's no real mistakes that are going to leave a significant impact unless, of course, you get those initial proportions wrong or the underlying foundation just is flawed from the very get-go. That's when you run into problems and why I do place so much importance on making sure that you get those foundations figured out right at the start, before you jump into the details and before you really start to refine the, the topping, so to speak, the decorative aspects of the design that are really going to give it its final aesthetic. But once that sketch is done, it's time to just go right in over the top of that and start to articulate and define the finished line work that's going to present the concept in all its glory. And in order to do that, I'm applying line weights as I go to the final outside contours that are going to encompass the main aspects of the design. And then within those primary contours, I'm going to start to add in the rendering, some of those details in order to add additional levels of texture to the character and describe, you know, how would this, how would the skin of this character's face feel if I were to touch it? You know, really trying to get some tactile, uh, 
visuals come through in the way in which the character is rendered in the various uh, creaturely aspects that I've incorporated into it. And because we are dealing with a humanoid creature design here, it does merge together both creaturely elements and also humanoid elements. So for the most part, the Arachnomorphet's head is based on a normal head. Even the proportions are relatively human placed proportions, you know, where the eyes are placed, where the nose and the mouth is placed. It's, it's really the same positioning as you would find on a normal human head that was that was tied to the idealized proportions that, that you'd tend to find on, you know, the Loomis structure and, and what so have you. But the difference here with the creature design and what makes this head different from a regular head and makes it an arachnomorph head instead is, of course, that I've added these giant fangs on the side of her cheekbones there that just hang off and kind of look a bit like the Predator. And that's really kind of what I went for here with this particular design for both the arachnomorph and the arachnomorph head is I wanted to have, I had in mind the Predator from the Predator movie. If you've ever seen that starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, the entire, the entire vibe of that particular character I really wanted to have come through in my own here. And I felt like the tribal aspects and the way in which the creature moved and everything else, you know, this thing, it moves like a hunter. It's definitely a predator of some kind. It's not a uh, scavenger or anything like that. It goes out and it hunts its prey, and usually that prey is going to be the remaining humans in this post-apocalyptic earth that uh, the story of the arachnomorph is set within. And so that's kind of what I was thinking the entire way through and so all of the design decisions that I was making along the way the way in which the hair was styled and the de decorative aspects about that you know as far as how it's tied together in this dreadlocky type uh, composition and someone actually suggested that maybe the decorations within the hair were made of bone and whatnot and I thought that was freaking great that's a great suggestion I don't always know exactly what the different design elements that I've incorporated into my creatures are going to necessarily be made of but sometimes I just know the way in which I want them to look I know the visual language that I want to use for those particular areas and and a lot of the time, it's just to create different points of contrast throughout the design to get certain areas to pop and to have depth within the overall design that allows it to become more readable as well on top of that. You know, when you've got that dance of tone throughout it, different areas of white and grays and blacks that kind of help to break the design up and make it more visually digestible, it can really make for a much more desirable experience for the audience when you're showing the pre them the presentation of your creature. And so I try to think about the areas in which I can incorporate those points of contrast, because if you can have those points of contrast, you can use it to draw attention to the most important aspects of the creature or the character that you're designing. Whatever it is you're drawing, it could be a full-on illustration. If you can strategically place these points of contrast, you can lead the viewer's eye to the most important areas that they need to focus on, that they need to pay attention to. And then from that point on, you can progressively create this hierarchy of tone and contrast in order to allow them to explore and take them on this journey throughout the creature design, the character design, the entire illustration. And that's really when you become a master of not just the way in which you present your artwork, not just in the... the the design of it and how it's going to look, but also in the way in which it's experienced. And that is when you're at a, a masterful level. I'm not saying that I'm there yet, but I do know that that's something that I'm constantly striving for. You know, I've, for the most part, I've got my proportions worked out. I kind of know where the facial features sit, you know, talking about heads here. I know the general structure that I need to keep in mind for the foundations in order to wind out with a fairly good looking drawing. 
But then what comes next when you've learned all the fundamentals, when you've learned all the principles that you will need to always continue recapping on and relearning regardless? Well, after that, you you graduate to these higher tier things within within drawing, these higher tier subjects and topics that are a little bit more elusive, that aren't necessarily talked about as much. And it can be tricky because of that. And a lot of the time, there's no real techniques or methods that have been outlined in a way that you can necessarily easily replicate. So you have to kind of make this stuff up on your own and discover what's going to work best for you as an artist just through doing what it is you've been learning to do. And a lot of the time it is looking at your work and constantly analyzing it, asking yourself, well, what what is off about it? What can I make better? Because sometimes you will find that, hey, every part of the drawing at face value is fairly good to go. You know, it's all well structured. The proportions check out. The anatomy looks good. But it's just missing something. There's something that's not there that you've been seeing within the work of the pros. And usually what that is is the characteristics that they incorporate into their work that allow them to craft the experience that it has, the the lasting effect that the audience is going to be left with. And that's difficult because then you're talking about things such as composition. You're talking about storytelling. And all of that is composition maybe not so much but definitely story is very very subjective because we all communicate stories in very different ways and you know when you're not just talking about the way in which you convey a story through the written word but then you start to discuss and think about well how would I convey a story through visuals that can be done in so many different ways because it's not just line art it can be the way in which you create mood and it's the way in which you you create the suggestion of a narrative unfolding within just this, this single frame of illustration that you've got to present the entire story with. And the extent to which you're able to express that can sometimes be, you know, it can be more or less. It really depends on exactly how effective you are at conveying a narrative through, you know, just a simple character design such as this. But I mean, if you can do it and you can make it that that narrative as potent as possible, it's going to make the experience of taking in that character design so much more immersive for the audience and it will stay with them for much longer. That's what it takes to create a memorable character design in the first place. Now, of course, this is just a character concept, so it doesn't necessarily have to, as of yet, have a super clear narrative express, expressed through it, rather. But as far as what we do have to work with, as far as what we can see, the primary aspects of the character story-wise that you want to make sh sure are coming through within the way in which the character is posed and the kind of costuming assets that you've cloaked them in and, you know, the way in which they physically look, their physical anatomy, that all comes into play. And those are the key ingredients that are going to allow you to create a compelling story around a character that is really only at this point just a, a diagrammatic character design. And so if we take the arachnomorphet here and we take a look at, you know, the the clothing that she's wearing, the, the headdress and, you know, the, the way in which her hair is styled, the spider-like physical attributes mixed with the human-like aesthetics on the, and structures of the, the underlying skull and, and the features and whatnot, if you take into consideration those things, well, you can see that we have this, this animalistic, savage-looking creature that is deadly. And, and that, that information comes through to us in a lot of different ways. It's the way in which she's posed. It's the claws and, and talons at the end of her limbs. It's the, the jewelry and the clothing and the attire in which she is wearing. And it's her overall expression, you know, those black, depthless eyes. It, it just, you know, one thing I wanted to have come through, especially within the head concept of the arachnomorphet, is I wanted to create somewhat of an appeal, an attractive appeal to this creature. 
just to incorporate that feminine beauty within it. And that can always be a fun kind of thing to play around with, especially when it comes to female creature design. Sometimes, um, you know, you just want to go all out on the ugly and you want to make them as hideous and as scary and repulsive as possible. But what's even more fun to do is to try and mix it in with a little bit of beauty so that you're looking at this creature and you're like, well, hey, you know what? She looks deadly and she's definitely a, a very creepy looking creature, but she's also kind of sexy as well. And I think that when you can marry those elements together in one way or another, it can really uh, it can really increase the appeal, I think, with them. You know, you're talking about these human characteristics that we experience in our everyday lives. Now, why is it important to see that within a humanoid creature design such as this? Well, we relate really, really well with human-like characteristics when we're able to see them in these types of concepts when we're able, because we're human, right? So that means that we have that instant connection of relatability built in within the character design. And it's, it's interesting because recently I, I saw the, uh, the new Lion King movie, right? Very, you know, state-of-the-art CGI, ultra-realistic. These lions look like real lions. And uh, the funny thing is, is, is now that they're not animated, you know, in a, in a cartoon stylized manner and the, the facial expressions aren't really animated anymore, they kind of move in a very realistic lion-like way, it is, there's actually a little bit of strangeness to it. Like, it's, it's very interesting to try to express to you the way in which it made me feel. Like, I couldn't relate with these ultra-realistic lions anymore in the way that I did with the Disney cartoon back in the day that was all hand-drawn and animated. And, and you know, their voices, of course, were coming through. They had human voices, but the expressions that they were making on their face, the facial features themselves and the way in which they, they moved... And, and Express just didn't seem to to really click anymore, not, at least not in a human way. Definitely in a lion way. I think if a lion was watching the uh, the new Lion King movie, maybe they would have been able to, you know, connect on some deeper level. But for me, as a human being, um, it, it just looked like a lion that could, could talk, but I, I didn't really experience the same level of emotional connectivity that I had with the cartoon. And I think that that's a really good example here, because when you neglect to incorporate these human aspects within your designs, whether they be creature or just normal characters, uh, the, the further that you get away from that humanity, the more unrelatable that particular concept design becomes. So if I had a little bit more spider here, a little bit more less human, for the arachnomorphette, she wouldn't feel as easily relatable. She definitely would feel more like a creature, like more, much more like a creature that you couldn't really read. And maybe that would make her scarier. You know what happens when we can't relate with something? Well, it, we either turn off and switch off or we get freaked out by it because we just can't understand it. it it's unnerving and, and we're not familiar with it. And so, you know, we don't have the, uh, the level of comfortability that we would otherwise have with something that was a little bit more familiar. So it's a balance. It's a difficult dance sometimes to really master when it comes to creature design and character design and you know the merging of both of them kind of in a way like in this case where you are looking at a at a relatively humanoid looking creature and I find it fun I love that challenge I really like to uh I really like to try to push the boundaries there a little bit and come up with a creature design that is you know very very human-like in a, in a way, very uh, uh, human-like in a way in which you could almost uh, you know picture yourself being this, being one of these creatures and, and communicating with them in a way. They they almost seem like aliens in that sense, you know, and I guess they kind of are. 
But that wraps up today's demonstration. I hope that you enjoyed the video and you got a ton of value out of uh, watching me whip up the Arachno Morph head. She was a lot of fun to create and I gotta say that uh, now that we've wrapped up this entire series on the Arachno Morphs and the Arachno Morph head, I guess we'll have to move on to something else now. But for the time that we've had with these concepts, it's certainly been one heck of a ride and uh, I'd love to do more creature concepts actually. Maybe even do up a course on the creature design all around because it's one of my you know one of my passions I, I really do enjoy designing ugly looking creatures beautiful looking creatures as well as we just saw there with the arachnomorph vet and uh, I think that we could have a lot of fun with a course like that you know say a six hour course or something you, you know what let me know in the comments below whether or not you'd be interested in uh, in something like that and I'll uh, th have a think about it if you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to check out www.howtodrawcomics.net and over there you'll find a bunch of tutorials written up by myself and the wonderfully talented Joe Catapano on all sorts of topics like perspective and anatomy and drawing cars and, and guns and you know every, essentially everything, drawing heads, whatever you need. We've also got a bunch of video tutorials over there. Uh, all the video tutorials, in fact, that you have access to for free here on the channel. And, uh, you know, most of the content over on howtodrawcomics.net is free. Like, 80% of it is free. But, you know, once you've, you've gone through the free content, you'd like to delve a little bit deeper into the art of comic book illustration. We do have a selection of courses that I've created, that uh, Ed Foychuk and Robert Marzullo have also created and hosted over on the site that are going to give you that extra depth of knowledge that you're after. So I look forward to seeing you over on www.howtodrawcomics.net and until next time, keep on creating, keep on practicing and I'll see you in the next video.